I take it that's your signal that we should begin. And let people get over here. Well, thank you all for joining us tonight. We're very excited to have you here and to be opening the exhi exhibition Documented Perspectives on Migration and Creation. I want to start this evening by thanking several people and entities who have contributed to this lovely evening. Um, Anthony Lee, our talented pianist. Did he escape that quickly? Anthony is back there. Thank you so much, Anthony. As I hope you've discovered, the KU catering staff outdid themselves today. There is delicious food back there. And the other, the other group I want to thank is our OCA team, our Office of Communications and Advancement. Uh, you see them generally in motion at these events. They're standing still over there. At least a couple of them are there. Um, they always do a wonderful job planning these events, and they don't get nearly the credit that they deserve. I hope also that you've had a, le a chance to look at the exhibit. This exhibit showcases programs, initiatives, arts, and scholarship that explore the intersections between migration, immigration, and creative identity. It includes creative work and scholarship from the KU faculty, from students, staff, and alumni, as well as from members of the wider community. I, uh, I really like this exhibit because of the strong connections it makes with this year's common book, um, Create Dangerously, uh, which I hope you're familiar with. It's a, it's a compelling work. I am told that the decision about what the theme of this exhibit would be was made before the common book was chosen. So it is fortuitous, but it does create a really interesting synergism between this exhibit and an area that all of our students are focusing on during this academic year, which is basically creativity in all its diversity and with all the risks that creators take as they express themselves. Creativity is a core value for libraries, and it is a key element for education. I actually began this year with a column to our library faculty and staff about creativity, about the kinds of unexpected discoveries that are made in libraries. Not only the, oh my gosh, I'm so interested in this book, but the discoveries that people make about themselves. They make those discoveries in libraries, they express those discoveries in libraries, and this is a wonderful chance for us to broaden the sense of what those expressions are like. So I want to thank all of the KU Libraries, our dedicated and creative faculty and staff, for their support of this exhibition, and also, of course, for their support of all of our students and faculty, all of the creativity that happens on campus. But there are some specific people I need to thank. Graphic designer intern Aubrey Burgess, who does amazing work. I don't, is Aubrey here? She is. She just doesn't want to be acknowledged. There she is. For her innovative creation of the main design for this exhibit. Most of you by now know Sarah Goodman Thiel, who is sitting over here and is uh, our community engagement librarian. Uh, she works with an exhibits advisory board, which includes Natalie Mahan and Samantha Bishop Simmons as well as Kelly Spaven, who leads that group. And they're all here. I should be picking them out individually, yes. They're, they're. <laughs> and the Community Engagement Center also has a wonderful and creative graduate intern, Con Connor Mulkey, who is right here, running this camera. So he can make me look bad, so I need to make sure. <laughs> No, that's not your fault, Connor. That's going to happen anyway. 
it really is a privilege and an honor for KU Libraries to showcase the scholarship on immigration and migration that is being generated by KU scholars and artists, as well as, as I said, the essential work that is being done by community organizations throughout our area. So I want to especially thank everybody who contributed their creative works and their research for display tonight. We have the pleasure of being part of a conversation that surrounds the topics that this exhibit explores. Um, I'd like so I'd like to begin that conversation by introducing to you our first guest, Cecile Asilion, who is acting chair and associate professor of African and Caribbean studies in the Department of African and African American Studies. Cecile is the author of Rethinking Marriage in Francophone Africa and Caribbean Literatures, and she serves as the director of the Institute of Haitian Studies as well as Associate Director of the Center for Latin American and Caribbean Studies. So she is very, very busy. Please join me in welcoming Cecile, who will begin our program. Good evening, everyone. Bienvenido. Thank you to each of you for coming here this evening. I am especially honored and privileged to welcome Israel Alejandro Garcia Garcia to the University of Kansas. As an immigrant myself, who negotiate in several spaces and who sometimes feel as if I do not speak any language, I am particularly interested in the works of Israel Alejandro Garcia Garcia and the ways in which he tells the stories of his ancestors his peers and community, as well as the connections between all of us. As a social commentator and cultural marker, Garcia Garcia uses his art as a vehicle to bring forth political and social change, awareness and consciousness. He is committed to challenging representations and pushing us to think about the various stories that we encounter. The works represented in this exhibit are also asking important questions such as, which types of immigrants are welcome to the United States and why? What are the different types of immigration? Voluntary, reluctant, documented, undocumented. Do all immigrants have the same level of access to the local economy job market, social services, and path to citizenship? <clears throat> How do communities include or exclude immigrants to urban planning, access to transportation, education, housing, and employment? How do immigrant communities interact with non-immigrant communities and vice versa? How do immigrants find survival strategies and maintain social network in their home country while trying to integrate in the host country? How do first, second, and third generation immigrants negotiate their identities? As we view the work of these artists, scholars, and practitioners, let us have the courage to engage in real conversations about immigration. Let us have honest and open dialogues about what it means to be an immigrant. Because if we think about it, the United States history and very foundation, we will be more conscious of the fact that many of us here in this space are immigrants. Whether our ancestors came here by force in shackles via the, via the Atlantic slave trade, on a boat about a century or two ago, to an artificial border, or on a plane, we are immigrants from somewhere. The challenge is to figure out how to coexist while mutually respecting one another and our various diversities and differences in the many Americas that the United States has created and not being afraid to name the daily privileges that we gain as a result of the fact that we live in the quote unquote century of the migrant. Please help me welcome Israel Alejandro Garcia Garcia, who will continue the dialogue on immigration. Thank you. Gracias.
Thank you, Cecile. You hear me? No. Okay. No? <coughs> Can you hear me now? Yes. <laughs> okay. Anyway, Cecile, thank you very much. That was really wonderful. And Israel, thank you so much for being here. We're going to have a 30 minute conversation with Israel about um, the creative perspective on um, social issues, issues such as immigration and migration. Afterwards, we'll have a time for question, questions and answers. So if you have um, some questions, keep them in your mind and we'll have plenty of time to do that after we have our talk with Israel right now. So Israel, you are an artist, a creative director and curator of a contemporary art gallery focused on Latin American narratives. This is in the Crossroads District. If you haven't been there, it's a beautiful gallery. It's called Garcia Squared Contemporary. You're also known as an activist and as an educator. All these roles seem to influence each other. Can you talk a little bit about your creative perspective? How you see art in a way for people to address the issues that impact them, like immigration and migration? Yeah, um, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure, and so far it's been great to be here. <coughs> Can you hear me better? Oh, there you go. Okay. Um, yeah, I think for me as an artist, it's obviously my career began in that way. Um, for me, the, the narratives have changed throughout my life. It's definitely began um, autobiographical within my own immigrant experience and how these choices that sometimes I had very little control over was directly affecting um, my life, not only as an immigrant person, but as an artist, and what I was able to um, work towards, or what was at my reach or wasn't. Well, so can you, um, can you talk a little bit about your life as a visual storyteller? I love that idea of a visual storyteller, and when you began to see yourself is that? Well, for myself, I think it really, you know, the question that's asked a lot is, when did you know you were an artist, or when did it come to life that um, that, that was the path you were going to be taking for the rest of your life? Um, for a very long time, I told that it happened to me my freshman year um, at high school while I was ditching and happened to end up at a library. <laughs> um, and in that library, I happened to fall upon um, a Picasso um, book that actually was a retrospective of the time of his work. Um, for me, that was really what I considered the point where, for me, a, a possibility of art in my life, um, the, where I could actually point to the spot when it happened. Um, so for me, it really became that, and I think I was always concerned about my own experience and understood that I wasn't the only one having that experience, I was just one person, and many that were having that same experience, and I think that I wanted to find a way to interpret what I was feeling, what I was living, um, and sharing it. I didn't know how at the time, and I didn't know. Um, where it was going to take me or if that was even a path, but I really felt that within my own experience, within my own narratives, within my own um, community, I would be able to share. And I think that's really the way I look at it. It's just being able to redefine or um, take in information and really present it in a different way where it might be easier to um, to digest. So, I don't know if anyone has, if you all have seen, but these two images on the walls over here are Israel, two of Israel's pieces. And I'm wondering, Israel, if you might be able to talk about the creation process behind one of your favorite pieces and what what came, what you were thinking about, what you were hoping to represent, that kind of idea. Yeah, um, there's one which um, the series is called Mi Amigo Jose. Um, my work does consist of largely research work, even the narrative, or just being able to get the imagery in place. Um, 
for myself, it's, you know, months of research, um, sometimes even years, to gather information, gather ephemeral objects. Um, I work largely in um, site-specific installations, which I use, mo use monumental works um, and an assemblage of works. Um, for myself, I think my attraction, my career as an artist within the art school, I think began in, in photography. And that was really the point where um, my narrative or my ability, I felt, to tell a story um, really came from. Um, and I spoke earlier about the thought that my first introduction to art was through this Picasso book. Um, I recently realized that it was through this image. So this is a portrait of my family. And I was the nine-year-old who took it. So I felt that that was really um, the point, I think, where it really, I, it obviously gravitated, I gravitated to the subject matter in some way. Um, and really is the body of work that um, came from this, this narrative and the relationship between my family and specifically my dad um, that really brought it to life. Um, and it's Mi Amigo Jose, and this is an installation that not only um, spoke about my dad's issues through alcoholism, but how it affected me as a child, my brothers, and kind of our family nucleus from it. Um, so this is um, one of the pieces from that series. This is a... Um, an evolutionary centerpiece of this of the sculpture. Um, this is accompanied with 16 32 by 32 photographs. Um, they are chronologically laid out, basically depicting the stages of alcoholism from the point where the bottle is opened to the point where domestic violence happens. Um, this series is shot at a nine-year-old's eye level, so it is about 32 to 36 inches of height. Um, and really, I was just really depicting um, the experiences that I remembered having um, as a child. Um, and I think my favorite part about this part, or this series, is that the body of work took about seven to eight years um, to produce and to implement. Uh, and the people in the images were actually my parents, um, where I had them, I had to sit down with them, explain to them where I was going to, where I was going to the, with this body of work, why I was doing it, um, and just really try to do a little family therapy session um, through this body of work. Um, so I think for me, it's really, that is probably the favorite piece is that my parents really gave me no hesitation. I think they both realized that I was a part of um, that environment and that I somehow needed to work through it. And this was my answer to that. That's really something. Well, um, you're in Kansas City, Missouri now, and you went to the Kansas City Art Institute, and a degree from the Art Institute. But um, can you tell us a little bit about your journey to citizenship in the United States? What that looked like? Yeah, um, that is a, just a crazy, interesting um, story, just to say. I think I speak about my citizenship as a forced citizenship because it just happened earlier this year. Um, I think as a U.S. resident, I always felt that when I felt ready and proud to take the next step, that I would do it willingly. Um, for myself as an artist and a curator, that my job, I need to be able to travel freely to be able to um, curate the bodies of work and especially with people of color that are national and international. 
And during one of my travels to Guatemala um, this past fall, it was really when I felt that the freedom wasn't there. Um, so as soon as I got back to the U.S., I didn't even know if I was going to be able to let be let back in into the U.S. Um, I really felt that I really needed to take that step, um, not because I wanted to be and because I was proud to become a U.S. citizen, but because I felt forced in the situation and in the environment that we happen to be in. Um, so for me, that's kind of a bittersweet. Um, experience you know i think we all want that experience to be a memorable one and i think it happens to be memorable for all of our reasons well now you're curating and um directing a, a gallery that showcases american art people of color art people of color and can you talk about the, how you founded that gallery and what the ongoing mission is of Garcia Square? Yeah, well, Garcia Square um, really began with the void. Um, born in Mexico, raised in East LA until I was about 18, and then moved to the Midwest. Um, and really that move, it was in East LA, you're in your bubble, and you really don't know what else exists outside of it. Um, I had no idea where Kansas City was, um, but that's where I happened to end up. And for me, I think coming as a young artist or an artist to be, um, Kansas City, I definitely came back, came with the sensibilities of the West Coast, but I think Kansas City is definitely where I developed my sensibility of storytelling. Um, the narrative does come from L.A. and Mexico, but I think it's really Kansas City where I was able to put that narrative together, but very soon realized that there was a huge um, gap of representation of people of color in Kansas City. This was mid-19, in mid, the mid-90s, really, 97 or so. Um, there were no galleries really taking a chance on the narrative. There was a lack of understanding of what the narratives were and how to interpret the narratives. Um, and there really wasn't any diversity or inclusion. I really came into Kansas City to a city that is, was, and continues to be highly segregated. Um, so I wanted to be able to within my own understanding of who I was and what, how I wanted to move forward, um, I began you know, my career through the Art Institute, um, through various um, local community colleges around town, and ultimately began to curate on my own. Um, by slow, quickly by doing so, um, began my career at the Art Institute within the Arts Department, and then painting and then photography um, shortly after that. But my, being able to exhibit my work became extremely difficult um, within the nucleus of Kansas City art scene at the time. You could do it in underground art galleries, but not necessarily ones where representation is an option. Um, there was lack of representation, representation um, of lack of diversity within the galleries. Um, and I figured the only way to be able to get to that point um, was through the creation of Garcia Squared. Um, so Garcia Squared is really a gallery that's focused on people of color, um, largely Latin America, both um, international and national artists. So I, I make an effort to go out and bring stuff that wouldn't necessarily or very easily end up in Kansas City. Um, I ran Garcia Square for the past six years, and it's been a really great reception um, to be or to exist in the heart of the crossroads, um, in the middle of what 
most considered Kansas City's art scene um, and be able to thrive. I'm on my seventh year now um, with the gallery. And this project that you see before you here is one of the, la um, the latest proposals coming out of Garcia Square Contemporary. Um, this is really an initiative that came from the lack of, there's so many art deserts that exist within the Kansas City metro area. I wasn't able to get to all of them. They weren't all coming to me. And this is a proposal that um, was just recently, recently founded, great partnership with the Spencer Museum and the Warhol Foundation um, in Charlotte Street um, and Arts KC in Kansas City to be able to fund this narrative where we would take a 40-foot 40 con 40 container, convert it into a gallery, and have it to go, have it travel specifically to um, Latino, traditionally Latino neighborhoods, and being able to take the art to them. Being able, so right now this project is going through a research project, and I think this is really just a continuation of what the gallery is doing within its brick and mortar and what it's able to do by bringing the work into the communities that either don't have the ability to get to these institutions or galleries um, or the time to do it. So the thought is that this would be, instead of a nine to five, would be a five to nine. That's really, that's so interesting. And it, it seems to me that this project in particular, you're helping people in these neighborhoods own their own stories through the art that you're bringing to them. And it seems like you have an educational component to a lot of the exhibitions that you do in the galleries as well. Will there be an, excavation, ex excuse me, an educational component to this work too? There is. So this, um, there's three specific sites, and the sites were chosen based on their historic, the, their historic I would say population within the um, the communities. These three communities have been historically um, people of color from various industries there in Kansas City. And the thought was to be able to now with the new residents that are moving in and with the residents that have passed away in the um, just here within the last 10 years, that if information of the traditions of these local um, communities wasn't being passed on. So I am really going into the city archives and speaking about how these, how that immigrant experience shaped these specific neighborhoods. Um, most of these neighborhoods can be traced back to the mid 18, um, 1890s, as far as when the stockyards um, moved into Kansas City, the railroad, and how that migrant population began to settle in these communities. So it's really a reintroduction of this history that a lot of the new residents aren't aware of. So I think the educational component does come, does come from um, reintroducing them to that history of the streets that there are actually existing in. This is a really exciting project. It'd be fun to be able to follow it as you go along and take it to the different neighborhoods. I'm wondering um, if you could talk to us about your own artistic identity and how that informs your work as a curator and bringing art into your gallery. Um, I think one thing that I've said in the past is that I tend, between my curatorial practice and my studio practice, I really don't differentiate the two. I think for me it's one lifestyle and I tend to execute it in two different ways. Um, for me, my curatorial practice and the gallery work gives me time to get out, out of my own head from my own work. I'm still deal, dealing with a lot of childhood experiences, childhood traumas um, that are very difficult to work through because they're highly researched and you're in your own head so much of the time that by curating works from other artists, it gives me the break that I need to be able to create my own work. Um, 
so for me, it, it, the, the two aren't necessarily two different things. I think for me, it's one of the same. Um, my visual aesthetic is applied to both um, in the very same way. Um, so I think for me, it, it's my work is still very autobiographical and it's really concentrates on what is happening around me at the time that I'm working on the piece. Um, right now, it does tend to be heavily driven by um, the hostile environment that we are living in currently, um, nationally and internationally, given the administration and kind of where we're at the moment. Well, I, um, I know that Garcia Spirit has a strong Facebook presence as well as a web presence, and on it you can find um, images of the different different artists who have displayed work in your gallery. But I'm wondering if you might have a favorite moment of one of the shows that you've ex exhibited at Garcia Square. If you could tell us about any of those shows that sticks in your mind. Yeah, I think I would say the one of at least one of the highlights this year. Um, is the current show that just happened to um, come down. It was um, Fidencio's work. Um, he is an artist from Oaxaca, and he basically took, um, Oaxaca is known for their papel picado, which is kind of the paper cuttings um, that you kind of see, seem to be fairly popular um, during the Day of the Dead or just different Mexican festivities. Um, and his his narrative was very similar to mine. Um, you know, born in Mexico, um, immigrated to the U.S. about the age of seven, figured out, you know, our individual immigrant experience, and then somehow ended up in the arts industry. And I think it was about a decade um, apart where our struggles were basically the same. You know, our family histories were about the same. The same way we dealt with the narrative um, was really the same subject matter, but just executed in a different way. And I think how he was able to transform that very um, Oaxacan tradition of papel picado or the cut paper into a larger figurative narrative where he was still cutting he began to cut the arteries of roadmaps. Um, so he would cut all the negative space and all you would see is this web of roadmaps, maps, you know, the streets stay their name. And just by being able to cut very precisely, very specifically, he was able to build um, figurative narratives through kind of these mass, um, road intersections. Um, so for me, I think it's being able to connect with an artist's narrative that how our lives parallel to each other, even though we were a decade um, apart. Kelly and I went to Garcia Squared and were able to see that some of that work, and it was really quite passionate and wonderful. It was Incredible to see it. <laughs> I can see it now in my mind. Well, um, so you came from Los Angeles. You've been in Kansas City for at least seven years. And as a visual storyteller, what do you see when you look forward? Do you, where will you go? Do you have any ideas of any plans for the future? Yeah, I think I, I just continue to throw myself into these narratives. I think for me, the inspiration for work is never ending because my life still continues. Um, I am still working through my childhood experience, even though there's some trauma there, there's not all trauma. You know, there's some happy, happy um, parts in there. So I think I'll continue to explore my childhood narratives and my own immigrant experience. I think my experience in LA um, is also a pool of, um, of expression that still needs to be told. I think the more I tell my own stories, the more I realize that 
more people out there connect to the work. I think there's more of us out there that need work that is really pulling at these emotional strings. Some don't have the ability to do so. I think I, I do create with really very little censorship of, um, or even protection of my own narrative. I really do it open-heartedly and, and I, I think I create for myself because I'm still, um, it's my self-therapy, it's cheaper. Um, so it's, yeah, so for me it's really that. I think I'm able to work through my own um, heaviness of, of the life we've lived. I think as an immigrant, um, and as a child of, of immigrants, my parents are still here, and you know I have extended family that are still dealing with um, a status situation. Uh, I think even though I speak about my own narrative, that you know it, I was seven years old when I came into this country. Um, it wasn't until an adult where I became a resident. But I think it, it's all those moments in between that I'm still telling. And I think that that narrative continues to be relevant, if not only to myself, to other people that are likewise going through these different um, experiences and are every now and then looking for someone to um, be able to tell their stories to. So I think I, I, I consider myself um, you know, I can't retire from this thing, so I, I, I'll just keep on going. I don't think there's a stopping point for me. Um, I really hope you do. I think that um, the work you're do doing is encouraging others to think in the same way, and certainly giving others the opportunity to display their art is a wonderful, wonderful gift that you're giving. Um, that's the end of our formal questions, but I'd love to open it up for questions from you guys. It's therapy. <laughs> I'll ask one. Um, I would love to hear more about the alcoholism thing. Did, did you and your parents kind of have a conversation beforehand, or like has your dad and have you reconciled with your dad? Or like how was that whole process? Well, I think for me, I think it became to be more of, I didn't give him a chance to really say no. Um, but my dad had moments of sobriety. You know, it, he would go months or years. Um, and for me, it was always waiting for that time. I, I knew I wanted, I, I knew I didn't want to enable um, his illness or his behavior. Um, but I knew that I needed to work through this imagery that continued to um, resonate in my head. Um, so for me, I think it was really just sitting one day saying, you know, these are the memories that I remember as a seven, eight year old. I need to work through them because I don't know what is fact or what my seven year old or eight year old head um, added to those memories. But I really needed to work through them. Um, for, and for me, I think it, it, it all happened a, at the right time. My son had just turned um, seven or eight years old. So I knew I wanted him to be part of the work. Um, my parents were um, at a point where my dad was sober and my mom love her to death, she was just always supportive. Um, and I think the fact that they really didn't question it or pull back on me trying to figure out all this work. The work was shot in medium format. Um, it was shot during the week. And it was really just recreating these images in my head. Um, this mood that I felt um, happened as my dad my dad as my dad's drinking day continued. Um, 
and all through this seven-year-old perspective. So I think within the series of 16 photographs, you, the, at, at first look, you just don't really um, understand the perspective. It just looks like straight on. But then through the perimeter of the imagery, you start seeing doorknobs at eye level. Um, you start seeing when the beating happens, it happens at a lower level. So I think there's hints throughout the photography that shows where these images are coming from and to whose perspective is coming from. Um, it's both my parents um, and then my son representing myself as the seven year old um, that is embodied in the seven, 16 images. So, um, so yeah, I think I, by that point, I was mainly um, giving directions and saying we're going to do this whether you like it or not because you put me through it. So what has been the response of non-immigrant uh, community to your work and to what you're trying to do in your, in your gallery? Yeah, um, I think for myself, it's it's been a great response. I think being putting myself in the heart of the crossroads opening the gallery there amongst the um, the rest of the arts district. Um, and I think my fear was that nobody's going to get what I'm doing, that nobody's going to get the narratives or understand. Um, but I really found that it was really the opposite of that, is that nobody was giving the general population a chance. You know, they were underestimating their audience. And I wanted to make sure that I didn't do that because I was not only expressing my own narrative, but I was expressing other people of color's narrative that really related to all of us as human beings. I think we, it might be a little bit more colorful, but I think overall there are narratives that are rooted in family values um, and our own ethics. So I think for myself, I, I do exist because the general population um, continue to come back to the gallery and appreciate these storytelling. It's not only my own, but of the artists that I bring into town. So I, I have, I, I found support throughout, and which is why I still exist. So I'm curious about your experience. So you're a young man, and you come from East LA mm -hmm. to the Kansas City Art Institute. So what was your experience when you came? What kept you here? What made you stay? Did I you would doubt your decision to come that far? Mm -hmm. I'm, just, <laughs> I'm curious as a young man how that felt. Yeah, well, I, I think really the unknown. I, I, I understood um, at that point that I needed to get out of LA. I think anybody that was there in the during the mid 80s to the mid 90s it was hugely violent east l.a was you know a death a day um drive-by shootings were you know just a way of life for us um couldn't go to parks couldn't do any of that thing you know we had so much time in our front yard because we just kind of our second nature was drop and roll for the earthquakes, but it was, you know, same thing for the drive-by shootings. So um, in 96, my son was just born. Um, so I did realize at that point that I needed to leave, not only because like we couldn't make ends meet as a working family in um, LA, but that the environment had to change. That I wanted to make sure that my son wasn't being raised in that environment. And I think it's difficult to leave. Luckily enough, I had my dad that had worked in Kansas City, which is the only way Kansas City came into the picture. Is my dad had worked as a contractor here, and he's like, well, you know, it's green. <laughs> and it snows, you know, come check it out. Um, so we did. We had no experience of snow. I remember driving from LA to Kansas City, and we might have been 
in the Oklahoma and it started snowing. We just stopped. We had no idea what to do. Um, so our introduction to the Midwest was a quick trip where we stopped and watched it snow for a couple of minutes. Okay, um, this may be really personal, but I'm going to ask you this anyway. We were on our way to Colorado on Friday. We stopped in Goodland overnight. In the morning when we got up to get in our car, there were um, some Mexican-American guys in a truck and a white guy. And something happened. They bumped his door or something, and they pulled out real fast, and he went after them. All of this happened when we were getting into our car. When he came back around the side of the car, he said out loud, probably illegals. And so we went in and sat down for our breakfast and we started talking. And as a Holocaust educator, I thought, I said to my husband, it sounds like they must be a Jew. That's saying, that's what we're starting to hear in our country. And so my question to you is, what are you frightened? Because I think that's really, that's a scary, that can lead to really horrible things. Right. When we start doing that towards people. Um, so my question, and for your child, for your children as well, well what and are I your think, thoughts? I think my, my initial fear is I, I think that there's, there's a false sense of security because I'm, just because I'm a U.S. citizen now. Um, you know, I think that even though we see more of it, it's been happening. For a long time, you know, it's, it, it just happens to be documented more often. You know, I think that's been my childhood in California forever. Um, and I, I think I, I, I tend to be braver about my voice, I think. I think that by me being able to tell my own story from an immigrant perspective, I'm telling the stories of those who can't. I remember myself still being or going through the status of being documented. I couldn't be as expressive. I felt censored. I feel like there's a lot of stuff I couldn't say because I didn't want anybody to know who I was or ask the questions, you know, where where's it coming from? Where do you come from? And, you know, we wanted to exist in that shadow. And I think as an artist, to exist in this idea of a shadow is impossible, you know. I and and I think that for ourselves, I think we create to be able to share our work. Not that it's going to make a difference. It made a difference for us, which is why we created it. And I think what happens when it exists in the world, it's really. Um, to everybody's perspective and everybody's experience. Um, I think one thing that I do with my own work and with the gallery, I I don't post a artist statement or the um, work statement that I'm exhibiting. I choose not to do so because I want whoever is coming into the space not be informed by how I put the show together or how the artist sees it. I want them to be informed solely by their own experience and how they confront the because I, I didn't want to underestimate. I, I, I knew that we all come into a gallery with our own experiences, and that's truly why the work is being produced. And I think after, if they continue to be interested and really speak to the artist, then that's made available to them, but not until then. Um, and I think that's a smart choice because I didn't want to be underestimated when I walked into the gallery. I knew that my narrative in my space wasn't necessarily coming um, from what that artist experienced, but the way I experienced the work. Um, so my fear, so my fear, um, I think I, I, I've become a lot braver in the past five years. Um, and my fear are those that surround me that are still going through this struggle. They really have no way out. Even though my experience as um, a undocumented immigrant, you know, my, my status took 30 years. 
And this is, in my case, was the best case scenario. My mom was a farm worker. My dad was a laborer. Um, and it still took 30 years. 10 of those years was my documents being lost through the mail, where I still didn't have a status. I look back at my life and think, well, in those 10 years, my life could have changed drastically if I would have had a status. Because those were the crucial years. These were my undergrad years. These were no financial aid years. These were, you know, the ability to apply for outside grants. Like, it's, it was at the most important part of my art career where I still didn't have a status. Now as a professional, I could travel. I had to go from resident to US citizen because I felt that I couldn't do my job properly if I didn't. So it wasn't a proud moment, it was a forced moment. Um, where I think those of us that are immigrating and have chosen to become naturalized citizens, we want that moment to be proud and we want to have pride in that moment. And I think given our current environment and our current administration, um, I had to be forced. And I think I'm lucky that I had to be forced. I'm lucky that I, I'm in the situation that I am, I am or that I have been, but I know of a lot of people that aren't. And I think that we are being criminalized, criminalized just for being people of color. Um, and, you know, without having that conversation from that person, you just don't know their experience. You don't know their um, history. And I think that right now we are jumping, or some people are jumping to conclusions and not really knowing their status. And I think until you have that conversation with that person, you just don't know their history. You just don't know their story. And their story is just as... American as some of ours is. I'm going to build off that. I'm right next to her because that's the way it is. Um, I've been uh, an educator in the inner city for 25 years and other places around too, suburbs, even the country. Um, so many of my students uh, may or may not be undocumented, I don't know, I don't care, but they don't consider themselves really Hispanic or Latino, and consider themselves American. And they're trying like hell to go through that process. And the frustration, as you said, lasts forever. One of them is even, he's in my condo in Kauai right now, and he's afraid he can't even get back to his own country, but he's in his own country. So how do you deal with that frustration in your art? And do you feel any limits on yourself? Um, Price. Yeah, I think there's definitely, you know, I, I consider even though my set, my life into status took 30 years, it takes 30 years to feel safe. I think as, as, as long as you've been in hiding, as long as you've been in the shadows, it's going to take you that long from that point where that changed into feeling okay. You know, I, I, even though I know that paper exists, even though I know that naturalized citizenship exists, that residency existed, um, I never felt sad. And it's because you've already lived a life of trauma. You know, you've already lived a life of racism. And I can't take the brown skin away from me, you know, as some people are able to take out the uniform, you're no longer a cop. You know, you. I can't remove my color, remove my way of being. Um, so I, I think, you know, and I think it's the, as an educator, and like I said, I think this is why most of my initiatives do have an educational component, is that these young Latino artists, um, or Hispanic artists, um, need to have a place that is telling this narrative that their parents aren't able to, um, that are telling the stories, you know, we all are dealing with um, 
with an identity problem. You know, we, we, we are being rejected everywhere we look. You know, where do we belong? Who are we? What are we? Um, for me, I think if, if anybody asks me, I prefer Latino. But I don't, it doesn't hurt my feelings if I'm referred as Hispanic. I, I think we all self-identify. And I think, you know, it's asking that question is how you would like to be referred to. Um, that opens up the door to, for that storytelling to happen. I think being able to confront a person of color um, with that respect, um, wanting to know how he or she, um, how they self-identify, how that person self-identifies um, to be able to understand that story. So I think I, I always consider the population that I'm taking the work to. I, I always consider that I don't necessarily assume that I'm doing anything um, new. I think I'm just taking information and presenting it to those that haven't had a chance to observe that information. Um, but I think the fear, for me, I think the fear as a curator or as um, an artist is ultimately my surname, Garcia Garcia. Um, I, I make it a point to, to be, for people to actually refer to me with my full name because it took me a long time for that full name to be shown in a legal document. All of my life I've been Israel Garcia. Now when I choose to, I choose to be Israel Alejandro Garcia Garcia. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Um, I have a question. So I am so in love with the fact that you have a gallery that's primarily focused, centered on POC narratives, Latino uh, narratives. And I'm in the process of starting a year of research for to potentially open an intercultural space here in Lawrence, Kansas. Um, and I hear that it was well received, the gallery in Kansas City, and those stories and those spaces needed to happen. And I am really interested in learning what were the struggles, um, how uh, difficult it was to get those folks that don't usually go to galleries or see their culture uh, represented, how the transition uh, becomes into an arts and culture space. Uh, but at the same time, how is it received at the larger community that is non-minority? Um, I would say first thing is don't don't look to have anybody's approval. Just do it. I, you know. Yeah. So it's ultimately just do it. You know. I think that if you if you listen to everyone, there's a hundred reasons why you shouldn't do it. You know. And there's as many reasons why you should. And I think it, along the road, if I were to take everything to heart why I shouldn't do it. One is that we don't make money. You know, if you're doing it, you're doing it because there's a bigger picture out there. You know, I don't do it, you know, to be able to, I mean, I would love to have that big house. My wife would at least. Um, but we don't, we live in a small house, live within your means because you're gonna be spending a lot of your money. You know, um, for me, I work for what I do. Um, and that's really, and, and it, it, I'm the happiest person in the world because every day I get to get dressed, wake up, and go to a job that I love to do. Um, I love to collaborate with artists. As you know, we've had conversations. Um, so ultimately, it's, it's my work that has taken me to where I'm at, and I think you just have to be able to, you know, be able to understand where you want to be and just keep on going because everybody along the way is going to try to knock you down, you know, because you're going to be the first, you're going to be the only. Um, you know, there's in Kansas City, there's token Latinos, you know, that um, have already comfortably fit within that 
you know, within other institutions where that is the go-to person, even though we all exist, you know. Um, so I think it's really just moving forward, you know, knowing that for a while you're going to be the only one, um, meaning the only one that's wanting to move this agenda forward. I think it's valuable. It's valuable in Kansas City when I'm the only one. You know, there's enough spaces, there's enough narratives um, that exist out there. There's enough space, there's enough artists producing work to fill out, fill up, you know, universities worth of um, experiences, but there isn't space, you know. Um, I wish there was another gallery that I could be able to collaborate with and talk in, in the same narrative that, that is also focused on people of color. In Kansas City, I'm the only one on the Kansas and the Missouri side. Um, that is really solely focused on people of color. Um, so I would say, yeah, I think it's, you know, I was just having a conversation is that I haven't spent enough time in Lawrence um, to know its ins and outs and how the population in Lawrence and what the diversity is. But I think it's a valuable place to start. I think, you know, we have a lot of international students that also need to be included. Um, that need to be represented not only in the student body but in the work that's hanging around their city um, that's being represented in the walls and I think that's what I do what I do and I wear many hats I wear every hat possible you know I wear the hat of a, of a accountant art director therapist artist I mean I wear them all because we just have to be resourceful with the little that we have and a little is going to go a long way if you know what you want and you're not asking for other, other people's permission. Thank you. Gracias. You're welcome. No. Yeah, I think I have the final question. Um, so I'm going to kind of reframe what I was thinking about um, and tie it all together. So we have this gallery that's talking about migration and immigration and how that um, affects or inspires creativity. And we've also had some good questions that talk about fear of migration or being undocumented um, or living in hiding or dealing with racism, xenophobia, all of these things. Um, and I kind of want to recenter that because my research at the University of Kansas here, I'm a grad student, <laughs> um, at, is, looks at the history of immigration and immigration policies in the United States. And from the very beginning, um, from the 18th century, uh, 19th century, um, immigration law and citizenship laws have been um, crafted very carefully to protect whiteness and to protect white men's status and their property, etc. But throughout it all, um, migrants and migrants of color in particular have come to the United States and they have shown remarkable agency and they have um, uh, navigated these harsh um, unfair legislations and they have had families and they have fallen in love and they've produced some of the greatest art and poetry and literature that this country has ever produced um, and so I kind of want to reframe all of these things and kind of bring it maybe to a close with this idea of how is your work and the creation of this place for um, artists of color, right, claiming the space, an act of celebration, an act of agency? Um, or is it not? Maybe you can, like, disagree with that, but what is the, what is the, is it empowering? What does it say about, like, the spirit of um, struggle, I guess? Yeah, well, I, and I think, you know, I, I, I think, oddly enough, we're in this image here, um, I think that, you know, I see it as my role to be able to um, to make change or feel like I'm making change, feel like I'm moving forward in some way. Um, not only for myself, I think as an artist, I think I do view my studio practice as second to my curatorial practice. I think that's really the only time I divide it to because curating for me um, is more important. Um, it's more important because I'm, I am able to showcase these narratives that wouldn't see the light of day otherwise. Um, 
But I think in this case, this is a billboard that I own in the west side of Kansas City, Missouri. Um, for an artist to own a billboard and exhibit artwork became illegal in Kansas City. Um, so a private citizen couldn't own an, art, or own an artboard, or a billboard that was decommissioned back in the 50s. Um, so it was just a structure. Um, but the city had no ordinances to be able to let this happen, be able to let this exist. I purchased this property as an extension to the gallery because I wanted a public site to be able to exhibit public works. And this happened to be the case. Um, so the city for five years made, did everything they could to force me to tear it down. Took them to court, fought this thing for five years, and ultimately changed the law to my behalf to actually let private citizens own a billboard and with the inclusion to be able to not be advertising. So we didn't want the you know, the commercial narratives to be in these brown neighborhoods. This is in the heart of the West Side. Um, and all we were seeing is join the U.S. Army, you know, credit unions, banks, everybody, their mom and pop who wanted a brown person in their business or buy their product. This is what we were seeing in this artboard. It was across the street from an elementary. So I wanted to make sure that I had control over what was being exhibited there, what was being shown there to these kids, middle school and high school. Um, so I think to, to be able to get back to your point, I think that, you know, we are also, we also have the ability to change narratives and change ordinances and change laws. Um, this is a small one. It's a small success for artists and people of color in general, but I think that you know, we, we need to own our neighborhoods and um, that we can make change in the, at a higher level than just um, within our own social artistic expression that, you know, we also have a civic duty to be able to embed ourselves into, um, into the way the city works to make changes within. Um, but I think, you know, just like um, Connie mentioned, we, for me, it doesn't end. And I think for any of us that are artists and our creators, it really ends our narratives. Um, really, for some of us, flow out of us. And it's really having the material at hand to be able to <coughs> speak to that. Um, for myself, is to be able to speak to all of these subject matters or these narratives and maybe not solve anybody's problem, but be able to, by them experiencing the work, be able to speak to their own narratives a little bit easier, be able to share it with someone. Because I think ultimately those of us that are people of color, um, whether we're um, documented or undocumented, we're all just wanting to be part of a community and wanting to share our own story. Um, and whether we do that verbally, artistically, musically, I think we're all just wanting to be heard in some, in some sense. And I think it's those that um, are not, I think, you know, and I, I think the Midwest, I think it's a place where it's very unique. I think Kansas City, Missouri, and Kansas is very unique to how welcoming the community is to people of color. Um, even though it's highly segregated, which is kind of, it's, it's hard to take how nice you always hear about the Midwestern um, niceness, but it's still segregated. And I think we see that within our city, within, um, how our city functions, you know, our city, Kansas City is just as broken as any other system. You know, when it comes to funding arts, it's just as broken. When it comes to funding people of color, it's just as broken. Um, you know, my narratives, I've, I've written proposals, I've shown work that 
is going to hit, you know, is going to push buttons and the city just doesn't give a second look because they don't want to ruffle the feathers. Um, but yet they're funding other artists, you know, with thousands and thousands of dollars um, at their expense. So it's, you know, we, we do have an uphill battle, but I think we just keep on going. You know, I think we, I do my part and you all will do your part to um, not only make that person of color um, feel a little bit better, um, but I think also yourselves. I think, you know, if, if those that are around us feel better, we feel better. And I think for me, that's the way I like to look at my experience and the experiences that I'm trying to um, exhibit at the gallery is just, you know, showing these experiences and hoping that somebody can walk away um, with something. Um, gladly, you know, that nobody, um, they, they just don't come in and out, you know, I, I've had great experience and I think great reception, but there's still a lot of work to do. Um, I think, got a quick one? Mm -hmm. I just want to add, add something. Uh-huh. Go ahead. Do you have a microphone? No? Sorry. Thanks. Uh, just listening to your talk is a great um, experience uh, to know immigrants uh, living in the U.S. Myself as a immigrant, uh, I had a um, different experience. I just wanted to add, you know, we are talking about immigrants. Immigrants have a very broad definition. It's also depending on when you come to this country, either you are as a child or as an adult. I came here when I was 25, so I had both educations in China and in the U.S. So my struggles compared to a um, person like you, you came here as a seven-year-old boy. So your experience is very different from my experience. And regarding to that gentleman's question, you are talking about you know, the younger generation of immigrants living in the US. They probably were, they were born here, but they never really go back to their homeland. And they had a big fear, you know, how I can adjust my own homeland that I really never know. That's the question. Um, it's very real, but uh, migrants with color, uh, immigrants with color and immigrants from Europe also has a different experience living in the U.S. I just wanted to address that aspect. Yeah, no, and you're right. I think, you know, just from the gallery itself, you know, a seven-year-old experience brought into this country is a very different than a 25-year-old, I think. For myself, is continuing to struggle with, a, um, with my own identity, you know, whether, like I said, whether I self-identify as Latino, Hispanic, where, where is a Chicano? You know, there's so many... Um, identities out there and I think we will always I think because we struggle where we're being formed and I think for me as a child the vagueness of where I was growing up just was there you know there was no one thing um, that defined my identity so for myself a lot of my work is finding that identity so I hope you'll join me in thanking Israel Alejandro Garcia Garcia. You brought a powerful and compelling narrative to us today. So thank you very much. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Cecile, if she's still here. We appreciate the insights that all of you have brought tonight. Appreciate the questions and the interaction. I hope you have a lovely evening. I do need to remind you, 
since I don't have my sheet of paper, I was going to forget that there are two other gallery lecture series presentations here in the Heracomb Gallery on September 21st and October 30th. So mark your calendars for those. They will be around the same topic as the exhibit and as the talk tonight. We hope you can join us. And again, thank you for being here and have a wonderful evening.